gracious Dr. Liz. Now, is it going to be Coach Dr. Liz or Dr. Coach Liz? I can't decide. I think just call me Liz, please. <laughs> it's really fun to brag on you. <laughs> I'll have like one day of like, okay, it's Dr. Liz. Thank you very much. But then the rest is just like, no, no, no. It's Coach Liz to you. All right, fine. We'll go with Coach Liz for now or just Liz, <laughs> whatever. Um, I'm going to give people a few moments to come in. I'm going to get comments going. We're going to pin this to the top so people can easily find it. So we're just going to give people a few seconds. All right. How are you doing today, Liz? You know, I'm doing great. It's so I'm in Los Angeles and it is so warm outside. And something about even though we're stuck inside, when it's sunny and warm outside, it just it lifts my spirits. It is so nice. It makes everything so much better. <laughs> Mark the announcement. There we go. We already have a comment. Who's tuning in already? Nicole Cantor. Hello, ladies. Hello, Derek. All right, great. We are ready to rock and roll. Okay. A few announcements for people. Um, we've got a live workout tomorrow, a Facebook live workout tomorrow with Coach Jared, Full Body Sweat. So tune in tomorrow for that at 5 p.m. Pacific time. And then on Saturday, we have a super special uh, Facebook live workout. It's going to be Coach Paul leading yours truly through a workout for charity. It is our first donation-based Facebook live workout, and the proceeds will go towards Procure Health, Pure, excuse me, Procure Hope, which is one of our community member, David Young's nonprofit that he co-founded to help bring PPE to those on the front line fighting COVID. So, so awesome. good time. that's going to be Saturday at noon Pacific time. More information to come, but I'm super stoked for that. Paul's going to kick my butt. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we've got people rolling in, and I think we're ready to get started. Hello, everyone. Hello, Deanna. Hello, Jay Nice, Casey, Linda. Awesome. Okay. What is up, everybody? It's so good. Whole house up in here. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Liz, would you please uh, enlighten our viewers a little bit about your extensive background in athletics and your education and your experience so we can let people know a little bit of what they're going to learn tonight? Yeah, so my fitness journey didn't start in fitness. I actually started in the medical professional, in the medical profession. Um, I started as an EMT, uh, so I was working on an ambulance, responding to emergencies, and that was while I was studying to be a board-certified athletic trainer. Wow. Um, so I've been an athletic trainer for about, oh my gosh, I don't even want to do the math, <laughs> 10 years now, uh, wow. working, yeah, working with different teams from literally peewee football all the way up to Olympic volleyball. And right now I'm the athletic trainer for the Golden State Warriors dance team. That's amazing. Um, all the while I am finishing up my PhD in kinesiology. So I am a PhD candidate in kinesiology and rehabilitation science. My study is all about injury evaluation. So what I do, what my specialty is, is is identifying who is at risk and why for injuries. And so it's really nice that my athletic training background, my research, and then tonal and all of my coaching has this beautiful overlap and each one kind of informs the other. So I feel like the way that I view the body is coming from a very holistic perspective. So basically everyone, she knows what you're what she's talking about. <laughs> Sometimes. There's always so much more to learn, for sure. Of course. Your motto is stay curious, as it's written behind you. So Stay curious. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> and so we actually polled the community, and we asked them what they're having the most trouble with. Is it knees? Is it hips? Is it whatever. And their overwhelming response was lower back pain. So we wanted to put this tonal lab together to really deep dive into what could be causing their lower back pain, um, self-assessments that they can do. You're going to take me through some self-assessments and I don't know how I'm going to do. I haven't done them in advance. And then you're going to hopefully give some, some advice, some treatments, uh, not prescriptive. We're not saying this is in place of what your medical doctor or your uh, physical therapist says, but it's just a way for us to get to know our own bodies a little bit but a little bit better understand what's happening in an, in our anatomy so that we can lift safer and stronger on tonal. Yes. Sound fair? Sounds good. And if you've taken any of my workouts or any of my programs, you'll know that I'm always encouraging you to listen to your body. So I'm hoping that today, what we share today and what I take Kate through, you can also take yourself through to help you listen to your body a little bit better. Yeah. So grab your yoga mats. We're going to need them in a couple minutes. But first, let's go a little over a little bit of anatomy. 
This okay, is a cool. cool lab. We get to get real technical. We get to dive deep here. So let's go. This is great. I, I used to teach anatomy, so I'm like, this is feeling so good. I get to do it again. <laughs> Professor Liz reporting for duty. Here we um, go. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, so the spine is really interesting. You have your cervical spine, thoracic, lumbar, sacrum, and then your tailbone or your coccyx. And a lot of people think that the curves in the spine are really there to help with impact. But if you think about throughout your day, you're not really enduring a lot of impact. But if And if you look at it from the posterior view, you'll see that the spine is stacked straight up and down. And so that really, the, the function of the spine is more about rotation and being able to uh, rotate and twist and create and generate power from the foot all the way up through to the shoulder. Um, of course, it's going to be supporting the weight of your body and the head and everything kind of comes back down to the spine. So it's no wonder that so many people are dealing with back pain because all of that weight transfer goes down into the spine. Right into um, that lower back. Right into the lower back. You have your thickest vertebra right at the bottom. It's de The spine is designed that way because you're holding most of your weight. And all of that impact is coming right into your lumbar spine. So that's where we actually see a lot of the injuries. Mm -hmm. um, the spine's function is also to protect the spinal cord and to help with some posture and control and give your muscles and bones something to attach to. Brian Shellabarger just said, I like that I'm watching this one slouched over at my desk. So let's all take a second to sit up nice <laughs> and tall. <laughs> What is that? <laughs> it's so funny. Whenever I whenever I um, am talking to somebody about, oh, yes, you know, we'll take a look at your posture, they immediately go. <laughs> <laughs> <I know. laughs> so we got you, Brian. <laughs> um, so the next slide will take a look less about the bony structures and more about the anatomy of the muscles, which is what we're really focused on here. Um, so the anatomy and function of the musculature. So the muscles that attach at the spine are really for mobility and function. They help protect the vital organs because otherwise your organs are just out there. There's nothing protecting them. So your core musculature actually protects all of the guts. And then, of course, force transfer. So to be able to generate power, like in a standing lift or a standing chop or a punch or any movement, that rotational ability to generate power through the glutes, up through the lats and into the shoulder. Um, and then again, providing the muscles provide for some postural control and stability. So it's not just, you know, your spine is there to hold you up. There's a lot more going on in terms of how the glutes work, how the hips work, how the muscles around the spine work. So it might not just be a disc thing or a spine thing, right? Totally. And more often than not, it is really just because look at all of them. If you look how complicated it mm. is, you know, this isn't, I'm, I'm not bringing this up to give you a anatomy lesson. I'm bringing this up to show you it. There's a lot going on there. Mm -hmm. So when you find that your low back pain feels kind of mysterious um, and, and it's hard to get to the bottom of it, this is why. So I'm going to help you uncover the layers of, is it muscle pain? Is it, is it bony pain? Is there an actual traumatic injury? Or is it just an overreaction and a compensation either emotionally, physically, or in the, an actual anatomy of the tissues? Yeah, I'm really excited to learn about the emotional aspect of lower back pain. That's, That's fascinating. Cool. Okay, I'm, uh, apologies to everyone. I'm just learning how to get the pictures in and out. So. <laughs> We might be doing a little collage work here. <laughs> We're going to move on and talk a little bit about the low back dysfunction. Just to give you a brief overview of some things that I'm keeping in mind when somebody, when a patient comes to me and talks and says, hey, my low back hurts. And so these are the most general common things that we'll come across. So you have something called facet joint dysfunction. So if you look at the anatomy of the spine, you have this spinal vertebra stacked one on top of each other and these little wings but the what hold them together is a facet joint and sometimes things can get a little bit slit or a little bit slipped up or slipped back and it can cause difficulty in either flexion extension or rotation mm -hmm. and so that will cause like a stuck a stuck feeling have you ever been doing like reach and rotate closer or opener and you just feel like wow i really i'm, I'm stuck that's usually either a result of some muscle stiffness or facet joint dysfunction. Mm -hmm. You can also have disc pathology. So you can have ruptured a disc or with if you're constantly loading your spine and either flexion or extension improperly, you can start to get some disc degeneration in there mm -hmm. or we can do what's called delamination of the collagen that's that's surrounding and protecting the spine. And that just delamination just means like you're breaking down the different layers 
Scoliosis is another thing, um, either a, a congenital scoliosis or an acquired scoliosis. So we can actually move in a way that over uh, overuses part of our musculature and can cause an acquired scoliosis. So a lot of the times I can fix some scoliosis in people just by undoing and teaching their body how to coordinate and how to rotate appropriately. And that could be um, like wearing your backpack on the same side all the time or slouching the same way, right? Totally. It's all these motor patterns, these brain body connections that we just have patterned. Yeah. Um, there's something called a spondy or a spondylolisthesis, which is a, a fracture um, mm. at, in part of the anatomy of the vertebra. And, and the, the thesis, the spondylolisthesis part, thesis means a slippage. So you can have a fracture mm. and a slip. And that's something yes. that. That's what we yeah. hear. Common. Yeah, so, um, and then, of course, the muscle spasm. I think we've all experienced that, like, ooh, pain in the back, and you kind of get caught. You wake up, and you turn the wrong way, or you go to pick up something, and your back seizes up. Mm -hmm. That is a huge – that is a very common issue, and we can talk about um, some of the reasons why that might be happening. Awesome. Thank you. And up next, we have um, influences of hip muscles on back pain. We would talk about hips. Yes. So we're going to talk about the hips. So the muscles of the hips – the shoulders and the spine have a huge contribution to discomfort in the low back. Mm -hmm. And you can see in this image here how the glutes attach to the hips and you have these, you have tons of muscles in your low back that are also attach to the pelvis and everything kind of works in coordination. This illustrate, this is illustrating a hip hike. So some of us will mm -hmm. say, Oh, my hips are out of place or I have an, an asymmetry in my, in my body where I feel like my shoulder is one shoulder is lower than the other. One hip is higher. And oftentimes it's not because the actual bony slippage has happened. That can happen. But more often than not, the pelvis is really strong and stable. And what can happen sometimes is the muscles, just like in acquired scoliosis, can become really tight, really tense on one side and start to be very functionally short. So my goal in working with you is working to elongate those muscles to get them to relax and to have your body feel a little bit more symmetrical. And so some, an imbalance that could cause that hip hike could be like um, maybe a previous injury that causes one side to be weaker and overworking or something like that. Is that correct? There are so many causes. So a previous injury, either on that side or the side that's compensating mm -hmm. and doing a little bit more work. Mm -hmm. um, it could be just a movement pattern that you've acquired. It can start mm -hmm. all the way down at your feet or all the way out at your shoulders or elbows and start to cause things up the chain as you start compensating through your movements. Absolutely. And just so everybody knows, we are going to try to save some time, for, some time at the end for question and answer. So if I'm not ans asking your questions, they're going to come later. Hopefully we'll have time for that. But we're going to keep moving right along. Yeah, we see your questions. We will definitely get to them at the end. Um, if not during this live, then I'm going to address them after. So keep asking your questions. Um, so the next is we're going to take a look at the psoas and the anatomy of the psoas really quickly. Um, so you have muscles on the outside. So we looked at the glutes. We looked at the posterior chain of the body with the anatomy. And now this is inside mm. of your pelvis. So right inside your hip bones, there's a muscle called the psoas and this group. So you can see two major muscles here. There's one lining the, the bowl of the pelvis that's called iliacus. And then you have one that's attaching from your spine going through that tunnel in through the pelvis and attaching to the femur. So you have a muscle that attaches from the lumbar spine and crosses the hip joint to move the leg up and down. So if you're somebody who in dead bugs or in leg lowers feels a clicking or a popping, this is the muscle that's clicking over the bone. The bony, you can see um, maybe there's a tubercle right on the femur that it's going to be clicking over. I've heard now, so many people say that. What do I do about this clicking? What is going on? So this is great. And so if you can use your imagination and imagine the rest of the core muscles, so that's your, those are your hip bones that you feel, think of your strong core overlaying on that picture. That's going to assist to create some intra-abdominal pressure and create some stability so that your psoas doesn't have to do all of the work. Part mm -hmm. of our evaluation today is to determine whether or not your psoas is working to flex your hip independently of good core control. And so we're going to use the same test to, to determine whether you do that. And also I'm going to teach you how to fix if you are doing that. 
Man, every time I have a coach on, y'all make me do the weirdest things. So <laughs> <laughs> constantly getting assessed. <laughs> so we're going to talk a little bit now. We're talking about all these causes of back pain just to give you a brief overview of what's in my mind when I'm looking at a body mm. and why there might be some back pain. So the next, we're gonna talk, next thing we're going to talk about is the emotional influence of back pain. It's a real thing. It's called tension myositis. Um, basically what happens, and there was a study done, I've linked it in the slide below if you're curious or just message me, I can send you the, the study. What they found is they, they have recently done this prospective study where they took people with chronic back pain, they followed them for a year, and those people who got better, they took a, they took a CT of their brain, the, the, where mm -hmm. the signals of the pain were located in their brain. And in the beginning, both groups, both people who whose back pain resolved over the year and people whose back pain did not resolve, both groups in the beginning, when they felt the pain in their back, the, 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 what lit up in, in their brain was the pain receptors. So it was like pain, pain. By the end of the study, the people who still experienced back pain, had unresolved back pain, when they felt the pain, then a different portion of their brain lit up that was responsible, that was the emotional center of the brain. So we know that they were feeling pain. It was very real, but it had shifted, and now it's more in your emotion. So people talk about um, fibromyalgia, mm. um, and, and it used to be kind of this tongue-in-cheek, like, mm, we're just going to call it that. Like, we, we also lump patellofemoral pain syndrome into, like, I don't know, you hurt, and so we're just going to lump it into that. But now we're, fi we're discovering that this sensation of, of pain or discomfort is very real and very associated with emotions. So if you've ever found that your back, my, mine does, when I'm worried about something, when I'm upset, my back will get really tight. Um, and so that's one thing when I'm looking at a patient or an athlete and I'm trying to decide, I'm asking questions like, What's been going on in your life? How are you feeling? If this is chronic pain, maybe you're now one of those people where we have to deal with the emotional component. How does the pain make you feel? What's it bringing up for you in addition to the actual biomechanics of how you're moving? Or are you dealing with a global pandemic right now? <laughs> yeah, also, yeah. If you're experiencing more back pain than usual, it could have to do with emotions, could also be how you're sitting in your chair, not at your regular desk, all sorts of things. That's so awesome. now, now that we've covered a couple of the like very structural issues that can lead to back pain or the emotional components, now I want to talk about the last, uh, the last big category that I'm going to be looking for, and that's mm -hmm. your breathing. So if we take a look at the four walls of the core. So with this, you have, and I actually just did a daily pause yesterday that explained this. So if you're curious, mm -hmm. go back, take a look at the daily pause. Um, so we have four walls of the core, and the core provides stability for that spine. So if you're somebody who has an unstable spine and is dealing with back pain, you might not be actively engaging all four walls of the core. So when I'm assessing somebody, I'm determining, are they able to engage their pelvic floor? Women who have just given birth or who have even given birth years and years ago who never re-engaged to their floor or people who have had trauma in the pelvic floor. Sometimes it can be difficult to connect to that area and they can it can be either extremely tense or too slack. And that can cause, I mean, that's a quarter of your core. So you're not getting the intra-abdominal pressure and that can lead to some issues in the spine. You have your anterior abdominal wall, your transverse abdominis, all the core muscles that we think about traditionally. You have the spinal stabilizers called the multifidus. They attach one little vertebra to the other just, and they make up the back wall of the spine. And then you have your diaphragm. So when I assess somebody for back pain, I'm making sure that they are breathing correctly because when we breathe incorrectly, typically you can, you can imagine that if I, you've seen people with postures where they're kind of their rib cage is flared, their spine is kind of larched back here, and they're just trying to breathe. They're, they're trying to use their chest muscles and their neck muscles to breathe here when if you can keep your body stacked, engage all four walls of your core, sometimes that can lead to a much better a, a resolve in your back pain. You can take a look at the diaphragm here. The diaphragm is a muscle, and it can get stronger and it can get thicker. They've done MRI studies where... If you breathe correctly, if you exhale fully to work to dome that diaphragm and create that intra-abdominal stability and pressure, that muscle will actually increase in thickness just like your bicep will. 
That's so cool. I'm going to start doing that. (laughs) (laughs) Great. (laughs) All right. So let's get into some assessments. Okay, cool. So stand up for me. Okay. So this is what it's like when I, I'm, I'm doing a very general assessment um, based on the findings and I'll do this decision tree of what tiny little assessments that I'll do after that. But for just a general assessment, here we go. So we're going to take a look first at your range of motion. So I'm curious, do you feel any discomforts? And I'm going to look at what your range of motion is. So I'm going to have you face to the right, bend forward and touch your toes. Okay, bye. (laughs) So we're looking here, if I could see her, we were looking here at uh, the the extent to which, no, (laughs) the extent to which she can arch her entire spine. So what I would be looking at, which you can't really see right now, yes, yes, perfect, is that she has good flexion throughout the low back, the middle back, and the upper back. And actually, I see a little bit of flattening in that low back. Do you have any tightness in your low back right now? I do. I have. My lower back has been hurting today. So for, for this, I'm starting to think like, okay, maybe we're working on a flexion dysfunction. All right, so now you're going to stand up, and you can actually bring the camera up with you because we won't be Man, I wish I had a cameraman here today. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm going to have you extend. So again, face to the right. You're going to squeeze your bum and lean back as far as you can while it's still comfortable. Wow. Okay. So that's a lot of range of motion. That's incredible, actually. <laughs> Did you have any pain Yoga. with that? No. Okay. That was incredible range of motion. So again, those facets, one thing, some people, they they find a stickiness in their low back. And that's usually what I'm looking for, for a facet dysfunction or the spondylolisthesis, something where those, those little facets are compressing against each other and creating some tension. I've historically um, had pain in yoga doing forward folds, but not back bends. So that's great. Okay, cool. <laughs> so let's get to the bottom of that. Um, so next, you're going to stand up tall, face me, and hands down by your side. You're going to flex to one side, all the way down, and note where your hand reaches to. Just note on your body. Um, the higher hand or the lower hand? The lower hand. Okay, down by my right knee. Perfect. And then let's flex to the other way. Any pain with that? Nope. Cool. Beautiful. And everybody at home, you can do this yourself. Feels good to stretch too. Yes. So is, has that hand reached the same place or a different place? Just about. I mean, I can't tell for sure, for sure, because I can't see it. <laughs> but it feels, it feels even. Maybe my right side's a little further down, to be honest, actually. Okay, cool. So as the spine is flexing laterally, we get an idea of, again, the facet joints and how they're stacking. If there's any rotation at a segment, you might get some stickiness one way that you wouldn't get the other way. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm keeping in mind. So if one side goes more than the other, I'm just keeping a mental note. Okay, I'm putting all of these puzzle pieces together. (laughs) So if you have no pain in in extension, no pain in lateral flexion, that's really good. So next we're going to focus on rotation. And for everything else, now we can come down to your mat. Okay. <laughs> see if I can get this camera angle okay. All right. Can you All right. See? So you're going to sit on your knees and face the right. Yep. Tuck your toes. Do I have my shoes off? Um, shoes on is actually might be a little bit more comfortable here. Okay. Then you're going to take your elbows and round forward and touch them to the fronts of your knees. Okay. And you can rest. Yep. You can rest there. Good. So now what we're doing is we're effectively locking in your hips by tucking in your, by tucking your toes and locking in any extra range of motion. So I'm trying to isolate what is the spine doing. Now take your right hand and place the back of your right hand on your lumbar spine, on your low back. Good. From here, nothing else moves except you're twisting from the spine. Go ahead and send your right chest up to the corner of the room. Good. And you want to imagine that your shoulder, your left shoulder and hip are up against a wall. Good. Big in, big inhale here. Big exhale. Good. Come back down. Give a little break. And again, open up. So now we're looking at good. Big exhale as you open up. See how you got a little bit more room with the exhale? Because yeah. we're doming the diaphragm, the spine feels a little bit more stable. It's going to give you some more room. So it's all connected. It's really incredible what the breath can do to affect the spine. Any pain with that? 
No pain. I just thought it was really funny. <laughs> <laughs> you look great. Go ahead and switch sides and let's see if one side looks different than the other. Okay, here we go. Good. Keep that butt down. Keep the elbow. Yeah, there you go. Don't cheat. <laughs> <laughs> How's that feel? Let's try to get big inhale, big exhale. I feel like it's a little bit harder on this side. Okay, so you have a little bit going into left rotation. You have a maybe, and where do you feel the stickiness? Um, actually, like upper back a little bit. Okay, cool. See if you can slide your top shoulder down. Big inhale. Big exhale, and use your muscles of your core to twist open. Yeah, there you yeah. go. Cool, and come on back up. So for you, the fact that we were able to give you a little bit more spinal rotation, it was really just a muscle pattern thing. So again, that's going to add into the puzzle piece and the, the diagnostic tests of what is the reason behind this situation, this, this sensation that you're experiencing when you're limited in your rotation. And so for you, it was less of a I'm guessing it was less of a bony restriction and more of just your brain hadn't yet completed that muscle pattern. So it's oh, all, it's really, they say it's not all in your head, but I gotta tell you, babe, it's, there's a lot that's going on in your head. <laughs> oh, trust me, there is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we're going to assess using two movements. The first mm -hmm. is gonna be a dead bug. Okay. So go ahead and lay down on the floor, knees and hands up in the sky. Is this angle okay? Looks great. Yep. Hands up in the air. Like I just don't care. Yes, please. And then reach opposite arm, opposite leg long. Try and keep the same shape of your low back on the floor. Good. And bring it back. Great pace. And as you extend that leg out long, you should feel like you're ramping up the intensity in your lower abs. Do you feel that? Yep. Right here. Good. Now, there's no such thing as lower abs, everybody, just for the Ooh. record. We just call it that because that's kind of the sensation you feel. So a little tip for you. Good. How does that feel? Any pain with that? No, no pain. It so as a, as a clinician, what I'm looking for is, is her, are her hips popping up? Does the arch of the low back start to change? And if you remember back from the anatomy slide with the psoas, you have that muscle, the psoas, that attaches from the low back through the hips and how and works to stabilize the spine, but also pulls the leg into flexion. So if she's relying on that psoas and it's overactive, it's gonna start cranking on the spine. And that's where her low back pain can be coming from. So that was great. So you passed that test. Let me make sure I understand. So if my psoas is tight or dysfunctional, then it will pull on my spine and my lower back will pop off the mat and that could be causing some lower back pain? Exactly. Got it. And that's, again, just a patterning thing, totally fixable. It's just making that mind-muscle connection where you're able to create that good core stability, learn what it feels like, and practice it in every movement. Awesome. So now we're going to ramp up the intensity a little bit, with, and we're going to test the same thing, but now without a tactile cue. So would you get into a bird-dog position for me? Sure can. All right, here we go. You're a lovely assistant. Thank you so much, Kate. <laughs> I don't know why I subject myself to these things. I do have a community. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so what I'm looking for is that she has a, a spine that remains unchanged as she now reaches her arm and leg long. Good. And did you guys see a little bit of movement in that low spine when she raised her leg up? Go ahead and try it again, Kate. So see how that low back dumped down just a little bit? Yeah. Okay, okay so now enough. what I want you to do is focus on tucking your pelvis, not that much. Hold it there, and now brace as hard as you can. Think with your butt. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So <laughs> did you feel your butt turn on a little bit more? Yes. Like crazy, right? Not shaking. <laughs> so when you do bird dog, if you do it right, it is hard. So I, I imagine a lot of people are just doing bird dog kind of like this and being like, I don't get it. This is stupid. Totally, totally. And I hear that all the time. But even to this day, when I do bird dog, I'm like shaking and sweating because 
This is harder than the dead bug if you do it right because you don't have that tactile sensation of the floor to give you the feedback that, hey, silly, you're moving your, you're moving your spine. Yeah. So this is a level up from the dead bug to say, okay, now without any tactile cues, which is exactly what's happening in your goblet squats or your deadlifts, are you able to maintain core stability? And if you can't, maybe it's time to work on that before going back to the movements that cause you pain. Hubert says, oh my God, I've been doing bird dogs so wrong. Yeah, same Hubert. So if you think this is just like an active recovery move, you should be feeling it. <laughs> okay, cool. Is there another Is there another assessment or should I get back on my bench? Um, let's see. So now we're just gonna talk about some assessment findings. Perfect. So we kind of talked through a little bit of this as she went, but if we talk a little bit about if she had some stiffness in the range of motion. So if you're experiencing stiffness one side versus the other, that can be that can be either an over overactivation of one side. So when you're not moving in your optimal pattern, when you're using your spine in, in, in extension rather than using your hips like Kate was doing, the body's not going to trust that you're not going to mess it up. And so it's going to start locking things down and limiting your range of motion because it doesn't feel safe within that range of motion. But the second that you start engaging your core correctly and moving your hip independently, like for example, in the bird dog, your, your body is going to feel like, okay, I feel really safe and stable within this range of motion. And, and the tension that you feel within your tight hamstrings or your tight low back is going to slowly start to dissolve. Okay. Um, overuse. If you're just doing too much work and, and it's being overused, just think about the mileage you put on your car. Yeah. Um, if it's a lot, if it's too much too soon, if you're someone who's doing like six days a week of workouts and you have never done that before, your body's going to start breaking down. It's going to be like, whoa. And neuromuscularly and neurologically, you're going to experience a lot of tension and a lot of uh, fatigue. And your body, again, is not going to trust that it's not going to give you all the leeway and the strength that you want it to. Your body's always looking out for you, it sounds like. Your, your body, what I've found, and I've worked with a lot of bodies. I've worked with a lot of athletes. I've worked with a lot of people who are extremely injured and deal with are dealing with neuromuscular conditions um, and autoimmune conditions. And sometimes it's not fair to say your body's on your side because with an autoimmune condition, your body is actually fighting against you. Right. So I try to be sensitive about that. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to your biomechanics, for the most part, and yes, there are some, some considerations, um, your body really wants to, to work well. And once you kind of click it in and you start working with your, in, within your correct form, you'll really notice a difference. If you're experiencing pain in any of the ranges of motion, that can be caused by instability, whether bony instability. So if you're having trouble, um, for example, in a Bulgarian split squat, mm. everyone's favorite move. Oh my gosh, don't even say that name here. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a curse word here. You have two halves, you have two hemipelvi. So you have two halves of your pelvis, these innominate bones. And, and normally when they're stable, they're locked into place, there's a lot of ligaments, but when, especially in females, especially females who are pregnant or have already given mm -hmm. birth, um, or for people who have ligamentous laxity, um, and there are congenital reasons for that, you can start to get upslips or downslips of either the pelvis or the bones that attach to the pelvis. And what can happen if you're somebody who experiences that and then you go to do a Bulgarian split squat, you're, you're taking one half of your pelvis and putting it this way, the other half of your pelvis mm. and creating forces the other way. So when you start to load that, it can start to aggravate or exacerbate some already existing issues. So that's something to be mindful of if you're experiencing pain either during or after that exercise. Um, instability or injury, of course, if you're injured, that's going to cause pain within the range of motion. We, we want to be mindful of um, any injuries that you're dealing with. And then if I see any asymmetries, like a hip hike or a shoulder that's higher than the other, or for example, with Kate, she, she had a little bit more rotation on one side versus the other. Um, we are, I'm starting to then look at what is the extent to which you have stability in your hip. And you'll notice that when she extended her right hip, her, her pelvis dipped down, which means that when she goes to create power through that left glute, she's probably getting some of that power from her spine instead of creating a strong spine. So it's no wonder that she's got a little bit of tension in her low back. She's got a little bit of a rotation um, fault there, a little movement fault there. And so we're just going to work with her to 
perfect the movements that we actually use to assess. So the treatment for this, um, or the, the way to rehabilitate this, is going to be to perfect your form in your bird dog, to perfect your form in your dead bug, and of course, go talk to a physical therapist or an athletic trainer. Um, do an evaluation. Right now, they're all virtual. So have somebody take a look at how you move, um, and then give you a plan to how to fix it. Okay, so I think... Um... Do I have another slide that I'm, that you want me to come up here? We we're gonna talk about. We definitely have some questions, but did you want to get into form fixes next for those things? Um, we talked we talked pretty much about the form fixes. So really, just keep an eye out for the form and fives. We discuss at length um, the form fixes for bird dog bird dogs mm -hmm. and dead bugs. Um, and you demonstrated a really great form for the bird dogs, really great <laughs> form for the dead bugs. So just keeping in mind your overarching goal in any movement is to keep that lumbopelvic hip region so still keep your core so still and stable so that all the effort is coming from the glutes so if you're not feeling anything mm -hmm. in your glutes which is a common thing that i hear mm -hmm. you want to you want to then take a look at how how still are you keeping your spine and a lot of that will have to do with are the glutes firing are the core is the core firing right it all comes down to that spinal stability yes so what are some ways that like if someone's watching this and they say, oh, I do those things and maybe even in the dead bug, they're not at that point where they can like get that connection yet. Do you have any tips for like a very, very beginner, like someone who's super new to all of this? Start by breathing. Start by breathing and fully exhaling. And when you mm -hmm. breathe, notice if you're breathing up into your shoulders. Mm -hmm. Because that's going to cause a lot of back pain as you start instead of instead of breathing out wide into your rib cage, it's a movement pattern. You breathe up to at least 30,000 times a day. So you're doing 30,000 reps of a bad movement pattern. Be just like if you did 30,000 reps of bad deadlifts, right? Something's gonna, something's gotta give. And so as you inhale, you wanna make sure that the rib cage expands out wide, not your shoulders, but the rib cage, yep. And then the exhale, you want that rib cage to close in independently of the spine. Mm -hmm. So when I work with my athletes, a lot of them are collegiate athletes. A lot of them are going through a lot of stress because they're performers. And so I notice that they're dealing with a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety in their life. And they start, their breath will show it. Their breath pattern will mm -hmm. show it. And it will come and start to turn into shoulder impingement syndrome. Mm -hmm. It'll start to turn into low back pain, mm -hmm. um, hip issues, because they have effectively disconnected one or more walls of the core by flattening mm. out that diaphragm instead of doming it by mm. not engaging that pelvic floor. And so mm. that's going to be the place to start is by creating that strong core and take a look at the daily pauses right here in the Facebook page. Um, the one that I did yesterday. So just look for me. I'm wearing all black. It was yesterday, and it is all about how to breathe correctly, and I hope that, that that helps you, and you can use that breath pattern in any movement that you do. So that's step one. That's your foundation. Build your foundation so Build that you can foundation. have that core, and hopefully help alleviate your lower back pain from there by keeping your spine in a proper position, and then your form will get go from there. Yes, and it's incredible because I'll work one-on-one -on -one with people. And our first two sessions will be just, this is how you breathe. Let me teach you how to exhale. Let me teach you how to inhale while engaging your core. Some, So many people have trouble just creating core stability while breathing in. And when mm -hmm. you create that core stability and breathe in, so right now, like, get tall, engage your core, and breathe in. It's like... It's hard. It's like breathing into a compressed air tank. Yeah, it's really tough people, to feel like you get that breath. Totally, and people feel very uncomfortable doing that. So the more comfortable you get finding that inhale with the core stability, with that intra-abdominal pressure, the less your back is going to take the load. Do the, and put pressure on that lower back. And if you have those dysfunctions of the spine, they're going to hurt less if you're breathing properly to support it, right? Absolutely. Okay. Wow, Liz, thank you. Wow, <laughs> learning so much. We have about five minutes left. Let's uh, dive into some questions. Okay, cool. Okay. I saw someone ask uh, how to fix the issue of the lower back popping up during dead bug. We kind of touched on that. Do you want to just give a quick brief recap for that one? Yeah. That's so fun. that's going to be a lot of you being very focused on 
pressing that low back into the floor. If you find that as you extend your leg long, it is, it is impossible. You don't yet have the core strength to prevent that pelvis from tipping forward. Bend your leg. I'll show you. <laughs> so you want to bend. Instead of the reaching out long, you can bend your leg and just tap your foot down to shorten that lever arm. And so that's going to give you a little bit, a little bit um, decrease your resistance, if you will, on your core. So you won't have to do as much work. Megan is asking if you have any programs on tonal that you recommend for people um, with unstable spines or anything that would help with creating that stability. Totally. So um, if you haven't noticed, my specialty, especially on tonal, is really getting out of your head into your body, focusing on what's going on. It's less about pushing through and more about tuning in. Mm -hmm. um, so my ab lab is going to be great. It is just a one-off uh, ab workout that really guides you through to listen and feel and stay curious about what your body is doing. And the more you do it, the more you'll be comfortable mm -hmm. uh, feeling what good posture feels like. There's also a program called Body Lab, which takes, I think it's a three day a week program. And so every day you kind of have that same mindset, but you're working all your entire body. Cool. Um, there is a program, if you are currently experiencing back pain, there is a program that I have called Easy on the Joints. Mm -hmm. um, and then Natalie has two recovery programs. There's Loose Hips, Better Back, and then Recovery, Release the Back, which I think is her coaching from home. Yeah. Uh, so she home. just did that. So incredible resources for you if you're currently experiencing back pain. Um, check out Body Lab or Easy on the Joints. Those are going to be great if you're interested in a program. And then incorporate these tips into any program or any workout that you're doing on tonal. Yes, yes. Um, Karen George Bradley asks, how do you fix the clicking at the hip during that um, dead bug? So again, that's going to be about being very mindful of your own movement. So that's happening because your psoas is very tight. So I promise you, if you create a little bit more posterior pelvic tilt, if you tuck mm. your tailbone a little bit more, and create some intra-abdominal pressure, eventually shorten your lever arm, keep that, keep that leg really short. Eventually you're gonna experience less clicking. Right now it's super tense because it's scared. It's like, I don't trust you. I need to stabilize the hips because that's my job because no core and no spine and no <laughs> pelvic floor is helping me. So I'm the only thing that's attaching. And so what's happening is it's like freaking out and, and being really tense. And so your goal is to engage everything around it to be like, hey, buddy, we got you. Can you can ease up? Like we're here now. So you got to bring in the troops, engage <laughs> your core, tilt your pup, press your low back in, and you can start to shift. If you really think about what your hips feel like, you can start to shift some of that effort into the core as you're reaching your leg long. So don't just yeah. flop your leg on out there. You want to <laughs> anchor it down and really find stability through your core. It's it's all about really getting into your body. So would, would stretching the psoas help in that situation or is it more just engaging core properly? Definitely engaging the core. One common misconception is when things are tight, to, we don't want to stretch them. So anytime mm -hmm. you stretch a muscle um, passively, let me make that distinction, anytime you stretch a muscle, your body is automatically, it has a reflex to be like, no, <laughs> and it's going right. to guard. Yeah. So when you activate and move within a strong mm. range of motion, that's when you're going to get, and you exhale fully and you kind of push that reset button using your strong exhale, your body's going to get, acquire a little bit more range of motion because it feels safe. So it all comes down wow. to creating that safe posture. So if you're, if something's tight, if your hamstrings are tight, if your psoas is tight, stop stretching it. I promise you'll start to see some major changes. Interesting. Yeah. Well, let's take one more. This one's from Philip. Uh, I want to help Philip sleep better. He said, my lower back pain is also down into my legs, hamstrings, sometimes calf area. When I sleep, pain is more in my legs lately if I don't, if I, if I don't sleep in a certain position. Any ideas, any insights in without, one minute? No. Oh. <laughs> okay. Without doing a full evaluation, it would be irresponsible for me. But what that sounds like to me is a little bit of sciatica. There's a huge debate in the clinical world whether it's always sciatica or always a disc issue. So I would definitely go work with a physical therapist, maybe get some imaging. That sounds like it could be nervy, a disc issue. And when you sleep, everything relaxes. You start getting some compression on those nerves. Um, and that's what sends that you have nerves that travel all the way down into your in your back of your legs, down your calves. So 
make sure that you're, especially you, keep that core engaged as you're doing movements on tonal or otherwise. Um, a disc issue is not a, a end-all, be-all diagnosis. It's something that can totally reabsorb, totally be fixed, but we just don't want to make it worse. Philip, I want you engaging that core in your sleep tonight, okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry we didn't get to everyone's questions, but I hope that everyone gained a little bit of insights into what could be going on in their spines, what's going on in their anatomy and their musculature, and just learned, if you take one little takeaway away from this, it's just to breathe a little bit fuller, a little bit better, to engage that core, to engage those glutes, take the load off of the lower back, and to stay curious, right, Liz? You know it, you know what it. it's all about. Um, <laughs> Dr. Coach Liz, sorry, I had to. Thank you so much for joining us tonight on our second Tonal Lab. Um, it was a pleasure having you on. And um, Liz, will you be able to kind of comment in on the feed later for some that we missed? Of course, of course. Yeah. You know I'm always in that feed trying to help you out with your figuring out what's going on in your body. So I, I'm happy to help. Write your questions below. Even if you're coming in after this live is over, send me your questions. Happy to chat. And this Facebook Live is going to stay in the group. It's not disappearing, so you can rewatch it whenever you want. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much for contributing. And I'll see you next Wednesday. We have a tonal talk with a very special guest who I'll be announcing soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Kate. Thank you so much. Have a good night, everyone. Bye. <laughs>